So welcome back to this final discussion on Anglicanism. Um, and as we've noted before, this is less a direct history of Anglicanism, but more of a conversation about where are we now? What are some of the things that uh, influence what we do and how we do it? So I think that's, that's generally where the conversation has, has turned. So we look at some of those historical markers. We're going to look at a few again today, but we've looked at those historical markers that have influenced our structure because our structure largely influences uh, what we're able to do and how we're able to do it. So the structure of decision making, the structure of, uh, of just how we make the church work um, has been really interesting and I think really defines what we're able to do. So that's where we've, we've spent a lot of time looking at those markers. That's what we did a lot last week was more of that structure and then looking at what happens when we disagree, uh, which is a really important piece about our communion as well. So because we're autonomous, because we don't uh, share the same governance, even though we have similar governing structures, uh, without that shared governance, the decisions that we make are largely uh, up to each of the individual provinces. So we looked at those 42 different provinces of which the Episcopal Church is one province. We looked at the general convention structure that is how we particularly make decisions, um, so which is important. And then we looked at the, the issue of LGBT inclusion in the life of the church, which is a position that the Episcopal Church has taken, uh, but for many of our sister provinces throughout the Anglican Communion, that is still uh, a, a subject for which um, we are in much debate and contestation about. So uh, the Episcopal Church has been a forefront uh, of LGBT inclusion in the church, uh, especially as we're talking about the Anglican communion. So not only the Anglican communion, but also in just the general life of the church as well. So with, within different denominations, so the ecumenical life of that as well. But so that, that, pr that question of how we disagree becomes really important as we think about what does it mean to be in relationship with uh, our Anglican brothers and sisters throughout the world. Um, and so we're going to look a little bit more at that today. So not only what does it mean to be in disagreement, but when we can be in disagreement, what does it mean to still work together? So when we are in disagreement, what does it mean to work together? Um, but one thing I just wanted to note, because this popped up this week and I thought it might be of uh, interest to people that uh, are coming to this class, but um, as we've talked before, the Lambeth Conference is one of those four instruments of communion. It's the one that gathers all the bishops together. So every bishop in the uh, uh, Anglican Communion is invited uh, to come and attend this conference. Uh, and after the Anglican Communion, or after the Lambeth Conference, um, you know, one of the questions was, how do we disseminate that information of what happens there? And one of the ways that they've been doing that are these different uh, calls on different topics. So Anglican identity was one of the topics that was, was talked about. Um, <clears throat> so they're going to be doing a presentation and a conversation about Anglican identity, uh, which is open to anybody. So if this has been something that's interesting to you, or you want to learn more, or even have your voice included in what it means to be Anglican, these calls are uh, happening. So February 7th and 8th, you do have to register for these. They're an intentional process. Um, so if you go to lambethconference.org, you'll see uh, at the top there, something will pop up and you can register and be a part of these conversations. So just note that uh, if that's of any particular interest to you. So again, uh, looking at the four instruments of communion, no central authority, all the provinces are autonomous and free to make their own decisions in their own ways, guided by the uh, recommendations of the four instruments. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Lambeth Conference, the Primates Meeting, and the Anglican Consultative Council. Those are the, the four instruments which define how we uh, kind of exist as a communion and exist in relationship, which is often tricky. But I think that's the place to start then for today. You know, thinking about we are in disagreement a lot. That's not, that's not uncommon. You know, when we look at, if you remember back two weeks ago when we did the full history of the church, or at least a 
30 to 50,000 foot view of history of the church, I made the point that most of these pieces that we're talking about are histories of disagreement. So where there's a disagreement in the church and then something else comes out of that disagreement. So either a split or a, a moving in a different direction, perhaps reconciliation later on. But uh, we talk about the church through the lens of contestation and through the lens of disagreement. And that that's just a thing. I'm not saying it's bad or good, but let's note it because that's not necessarily uh, maybe if we read the Bible what we always want to talk about. But that's also not to say that there's not disagreement in the Bible. <laughs> but let's read this real quick. So this is from Acts 4. And Acts, of course, is that book um, that's talking about what the disciples do after Jesus is uh, resurrected and ascended. So this is the early life of the church, the early life of the disciples that we're trying to figure out. So let's, let's read this. This is Acts 4, 32 through 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Just real quick, what do you hear in that? What are some of the themes that you hear appearing in this, this reading from Acts? Um, sort of a, from each, what they can give to each, what they need to have. Yeah, yeah, so that this commonality of goods is, a, is an early thing. Ah, <laughs> so you, you can certainly, you can read a political lens into the, the gospel, and we often do, so, um, yeah. There is a social aspect, that's maybe the way to say that, there's a social aspect. Ah, yeah, that's interesting, yeah. What else do we see in this? Following others. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Probably not a very yeah. Probably not a very yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 I think what it calls me to, and I, you've hit on some very interesting ideas, but this, this idea that there is a social nature to what's required to us as Christians, the mechanism for which we do that social work uh, is very important because there is a longevity to this. There is a, a, uh, an end game that is yet to be determined for us in terms of how we continue to do the work that we are tasked to do, but make it sustainable so that we, we don't get burnt out. You know, if you read the Gospels in the sense of, you know, Christ is returning within my lifetime, within the next week, within the coming months, this model might work, uh, in a sense, um, as we have uh, learned with our, our history and learned with theology that has adapted to the world around us, I, I think there is a sustainability piece with this, but there's also, I think the, the reason I kind of put it up here is the social nature in which the church is, is called. And so again, how that structure happens and what it needs to look like may need some adaptation. Um, and so part of what we are doing in our communion is that even when we're in disagreement about how that structure works, we can still hold to the social nature of what's going on. Yes? Well, that's just in It's inclusion. It's inclusion. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of everybody. It is a nice idea, though. I mean, and all those who believed were of one heart and soul. We're not quite there. <laughs> and I, I would bet that even at this time they weren't quite there. I think that there's a little bit of idealism in this, and that's okay, too. I mean, if you read the letters of Paul, uh, who was writing well before Acts is written, you know, if, if we think of Acts being written probably in the 70s or 80s, Paul is writing in the 50s, and we already know of disagreement. We already know that this statement maybe not, is not as truthful as it, as it seems. So there is an, an idealistic nature to this. 
And so uh, we're going to move on to this idea uh, of, we're jumping forward, you know, a couple thousand years in history now, but uh, this is a big statement. If you look um, at the back of the BCP, there's a, um, a, a, a section called historical documents. Has anybody ever looked at the historical documents yes. of the BCP? Yes! Good answer. We have some yeses. I love it. If you haven't, don't worry about it. If you need some, you know, if you need something to help you go to sleep at night, you can find the historical documents in the back of the BCP. But one of those documents is called the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral. Uh, and it's named this because of this is passed by the House of Bishops, which we talked about last week. It's passed by the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church uh, in 1886 uh, as a statement about how we can stay together. So this, this idea of having one heart and one soul uh, is complicated, but how do we stay together uh, and continue to do Christian mission uh, is a really important question. And so we're, we're still wrestling with this today, but they were wrestling with it in 1886 as well. So looking at the, if you remember, we talked about the missionary front of the church with all of the expansive uh, bishops being placed in different areas uh, and why the Anglican communion even comes to fruition in the first place is that they want a mechanism for how to maintain this relationship. So the House of Bishops passes this in 1886 and then in 1888 it is passed uh, as a resolution at the Lambeth Conference that year. So that's why it's got this, this silly name of the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral. But I just want to read some of this because this is, this is important to understanding the context of relation. And I think it, it, it's an attempt to do what we talk about here in Acts of having one heart and one soul, even though we don't disagree. Maybe that's the soul and mind of Christ, uh, of having that as our, our guiding. So let's just read this. We bishops of the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States of America, in council assembled as bishops in the Church of God, do hereby solemnly declare to all whom it may concern, and especially to our fellow Christians of the different communions in this land, who in their several spheres have continued or contended for the religion of Christ. So not only talking to uh, the Anglican world, but also talking to uh, an ecumenical nature here as well. So uh, fellow Christians in different communions in this land. So speaking about the province of the Episcopal Church. Uh, we contend for the religion of Christ, one, that our earnest desire uh, that the Savior's prayer, that we all may be one, may in its deepest and truest sense be speedily fulfilled. Two, that we believe that all who have been duly baptized with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost are members of the Holy Catholic Church. Three, that in all things of human ordering or human choice relating to modes of worship and discipline or to the traditional customs, this church is ready in the spirit of love and humility to forego all preferences of her own. Maybe not so. Four, that this church does not seek to absorb other communions, but rather cooperating with them on the basis of common faith and order to discountenance schism to heal the wounds of the body of Christ and to promote the charity which is the chief of Christian graces and the visible manifestation of Christ to the world. So these are four really important things that they want to base this idea of reconciliation of this, of this oneness. So that all may be one. So understanding that Christ wants us to be in relationship with each other uh, is important. Uh, noting the importance of baptism, of the, the introduction into the faith, and along with that, the teaching of the faith uh, as people are introduced to it. Uh, three is, you know, that's still a gamble for me. You know, we, we love to talk about how we can, you know, welcome people in, but we have a very traditional service, so I'm not sure that we're at three. So relating to the modes and discipline or the traditional customs, the church is ready in the spirit of love and humility to forego all preferences of her own, it's a good idea, and I think part of what reconciliation is going to take uh, and how we can contextualize what it means to be an Anglican in different parts of the world, we do have to let go of things. So there's some truth in this, but that, that's a hard one for a lot of us. Uh, and then four, uh, that, so this is, you know, that's a major Anglican statement there, talking about that we do not seek to absorb other communions. So uh, 
staying with this idea of autonomy that if we disagree, it's okay. I'm not going to force what I believe on top of you. It's that we need to stay together and stay in relationship. And in doing that, we become one, uh, even though we're not quite there. Yes. Yeah, and we're just as good as our country at making it work, aren't we? Right. All right, so let's continue. But furthermore, do we hereby affirm that the, that the Christian unity can be restored only by the return of all Christian communions to the principles of unity exemplified by the undivided Catholic Church during the first ages of its existence? Uh, which principles we believe to be the substantial deposit of Christian faith and order committed by Christ and his apostles to the church under the end of the world and thereby incapable of compromise or surrender by those who have been ordained to be its stewards and trustees for a common and equal benefit of all men. So, yeah, right. This is, this is 1886. We can, we can mess with this document a little bit. That's fine. Um, and so it, it, I think the desire here is to return to those, those early principles. So if we're talking about Acts and returning to the early principles of the church, what are some of those early principles? And so that's what this next section is goes. Uh, as inherent parts of this sacred deposit, and therefore as essential to the restoration of unity among the divided branches of Christendom, uh, we account the following to wit. One, the holy scriptures of the Old and New Testaments as the revealed word of God. Two, the Nicene Creed as the sufficient statement of the Christian faith. Three, the two sacraments, baptism and the supper of the Lord, ministered with unfailing use of Christ's words of institution and the elements ordained by him. And four, the historic episcopate, locally adapted in the methods of its administration to the varying needs of the nations and peoples called of God into the unity of the church. So uh, these are four very uh, in, in, ingrained ideas that note who we are as Anglicans. So we do hold the scriptures as in the Old and New Testaments to be the revealed world of God. We do... Uh, note that the Nicene Creed is sufficient. That's why we use it so much. Uh, that is the statement of faith of the church. We do hold that the two sacraments, baptism uh, and uh, the Eucharist, Supper of the Lord is what they're using there, baptism and Eucharist, those are two dominical sacraments, the two sacraments that Christ himself participated in and uh, asked us to continue as well. Those are two things that you'll see a lot <laughs> in the church. We do it every Sunday, the, the Lord's Supper. We do baptism as part of uh, our principal worship of coming together for the Eucharist as part of the community. If you came last week, you saw that uh, and heard it in the sermon as well. And so then four then is a little bit about what we've been talking about in this class, looking at the historic episcopate. So thinking about the apostolic succession going back all the way to the early apostles, connecting us and our bishops here. So this structure of bishops uh, is very important. And so the next piece is going to be important as well. Locally adapted to the methods of its administration to the varying needs of the nation. So that is a big change from where we were uh, when the Episcopal Church is being founded because prior to, as we talked about last week, was that last week? I get confused. I taught two classes last week and they're all mingling in my head. So if you came to the Episcopal 101 class, we were definitely talking about how Samuel Seabury uh, has to go over and be ordained because there are no bishops in the colonies. And so after the break uh, in um, the revolution, the American church is trying to get its own identity, but they don't have bishops to create this apostolic succession, which is a big piece. So prior or post that episode, we have bishops. And the Church of England even starts to note that it is helpful to have bishops in context with the different churches that they are in. So this, this locally adapted to the methods of administration kind of opens the door to where we are as Anglicans today of having this historic structure of bishops in place, but also being contextualized to where they are. Someone raised a hand over there. It was over there. I'm trying to understand the purpose of this meeting and this document. Mm -hmm. And it seems like in the previous slide, there's a lot of conversation about the 
conversation about who we need to buy, is it all Christians in this land, blah, blah, blah. And number four makes it sort of feel like, as long as you all recognize our mission, uh, uh, you know, if you're all connected. That's right. Right. <laughs> there sure is. So that's, that's the same thing with number three here, right? So I think if we're going to have this full unity, you know, we have to let go of some of our things. So it, it is very funny to, to have this document saying, we all want to be one, but these are the things that if you want to be one with us, you got to do these things. So, right. So there is, there's a bit of, you know, tongue in cheek in this for us, I think, to look at this, but it's still an important document. But to that point, I would say, um, the unity of the church does not necessarily need to all be the same. So these are the things that are going to define Anglicanism. And so for if you want to be a part of the Anglican tradition, these four things are going to be really important to us. Um, unity then maybe does not necessarily need to say that we all believe these four things. Uh, we can still be in a fundamental good relationship with you even though different practices are happening. So the belief in love of Christ may be the thing that unites us, but how that's uh, being adapted to the local um, areas uh, and local now could mean like, you know, Ghent United Methodist right behind us does it differently than us. So that's local to them and even just across the street, it, it looks different, but we can be in relationship with them. On this one or the other page? Okay. This is something that the words when the supper of the Lord must be exact. What, what if there's a stumble of the tunnel? You mean like I did at the 8 o'clock today? <laughs> or any week, right? Yeah. Well, no. So that's, that's great. So... It would also say, you know, if, if we believed deeply that it needed to be the exact words of Christ that are said, we would be doing this in Aramaic. <laughs> so uh, to the extent that the, the local adaptation of the methods of how we pray, it has to be, you know, somewhat contextual. So, and there's this wonderful idea that it's not me <laughs> that is blessing the body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine. It's the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is dependent on me saying the words right, we're all in trouble. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to say, but we believe that the, the act of the community coming together is actually praying that prayer together. Uh, and sometimes we mess up the words, but the words are there printed for us so that we know what the statement of belief actually is as we're saying that. And we hold that we can write our own prayers for this as well. So we have a, a specific ordo, uh, or, or, which is another word for structure of like, what are the elements that need to be in this prayer that help us understand the entirety of what's happening as we do the Eucharist? So we don't use self-written prayers uh, as part of our principal worships, but uh, it is within the confines of the BCP to write your own prayers for this. All right, we're, we're getting into the weeds on that one, but uh, these are important. So these are important to who we are um, as Anglicans. And so this is a statement of, of faith that the House of Bishops passes. It's never ratified by the House of Delegates or the House of Deputies, but it does go to Lambeth as well because the House of Bishops takes it to Lambeth and Lambeth also kind of consents to it and says, this is a good statement about what it means to, to be an Anglican. Um, and so that's why it's in the historic documents section of the BCP. So again, take a look at what's in there because there's some really foundational stuff. Um, Furthermore, deeply grieved by the sad divisions which affect the Christian church in our own land, we hereby declare our desire and readiness, so soon as there shall be an authorized response to this declaration, to enter into brotherly conference with all or any Christian bodies seeking the restoration of the organic unity of the church with a view to the earnest study of the conditions under which so a, price, uh, which so a priceless a blessing might happily be brought to pass. So a final little statement there saying that Basically, if you want to be uh, in better communion with us, write us a letter, we'll talk to you about it. So there we go. Um, so I think this leads to the question of like, what does Anglicanism look like on the local scale? Um, and so again, connecting what we do here as Christ in St. Luke's and even furthermore, what do you do as an Anglican sitting in an Anglican church 
How does that affect someone that's living over in a completely different com country that also lives into this Anglican identity? I think that that's, that for me is the most important question of Anglicanism. And I think we have a couple of ways of looking at that. And we talked about this a little bit last week, um, looking at the, the shared mission. Um, so what we have is that shared mission in our relationship. We don't have shared governance, but we have shared mission. So it's getting to that unity piece that we're looking at in the, 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 that Acts reading that we had. So we looked at a couple of different one of these, and we're going to highlight some of the work of these different networks. But these are very specific networks that are run out of the Anglican Communion Office, which is part of, uh, it's an office that incorporates all of those four instruments. So they do good work. If you look at anglicancommunion.org, you'll find uh, networks and resources for all of these. But there's a youth network, health and community network, liturgical network, peace and justice network, indigenous network. Uh, colleges and universities are huge in the Anglican Communion. Environmental network, interfaith network, women's uh, network. Uh, and I think there are a few more, but these are ones that are really, um, they, they do good work. And if you look at the ACC uh, reports, you can find specifically what these networks have been doing within the last three years. So the Anglican Consultative Council has some good uh, resources on what these have been doing. But for me, they kind of all get back to this, this idea that came uh, in the early, uh, this has been around since about the 90s now, the early 2000s, but these five marks of mission, which are set by the Anglican Communion, uh, and we, we have adapted them as well um, in the Episcopal Church. But these five marks of mission are written to get to this idea of unity. Uh, this is what we believe the work of the church to be. Um, so let go of all the other documents that we've talked about, but like what you are doing on the ground can be tied back to one of these five marks of mission and probably to multiple ones of them. But these are those five marks. So they're, they're similar in the style to some of those things that we hold to be true in the, the uh, Chicago Lambeth quadrilateral, but let, let's read these as well. The mission of the church is the mission of Christ. And so I would even further explain, expand on that to say that the church is only participating in mission when it is participating in Christ's mission. So uh, to the extent that uh, we are only doing the work of God when it is actually God's work. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so the mission of the church is the mission of Christ. One, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. Two, to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers. Three, to respond to human need by loving service. Four, to transform unjust structures of society, to challenge violence of every kind, and pursue peace and reconciliation. And five, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Thoughts on these? Has anybody ever seen these before? Okay. What does it mean to proclaim Jesus to people of the world? Well, I think we can do lots of proclamation. Uh, I've heard of Jesus, and I need someone to proclaim to me all the time still that, uh, that I am loved and that I am capable of loving as well and, and going out and changing the world. So I think that that proclamation is that it's a proclamation of relationship. Um, it's a proclamation that we are continuing uh, in our, our, our beloved state uh, and for, you know, God's goodness to surround us. Well, I think that's pretty central. That kingdom come, there will be done. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, I think when I saw that, that's the kingdom come, there will be done. Okay. Yeah. There was a big push uh, in... I don't know, it's probably around 2007, 2008, uh, for you to like go in, what is your mark of mission? And so you had to like, everything that I do in the church is related to this one mark of mission. I don't think that's a helpful way to do it, but you could also, you could go online and you could find a t-shirt that had your mark of mission printed on it, which I know it's always good. But uh, I, I like to think of these in the sense that um, these two, can be completed if we do these three. 
Um, for me, these two can be taken care of if we are responding to human need by loving, kind, or loving service, if we are transforming unjust structures of society to challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation, and if we are striving to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. So if we're doing those three, we are proclaiming good news for sure. Uh, and I think in doing those, we are teaching and baptizing and nurturing people that are coming into our faith that these are actually part of what our Christian witness requires of us. Uh, and so teaching that perhaps is a, an, an action and in, in doing. So, yeah, I saw a hand. This strikes me because the last three kind of mirror or reflect upon um, the acts. Oh, yeah, I think they do. Of the that after that, in these documents, we don't see. That's right. And it's so big, it's such a big part of the Acts Reading. Mm. Yeah, it's not sustainable, but, you know, maybe for the early church, you know, that whole discussion does okay. But yet, it was part of it. Yeah. And this finally, finally, but how far down do you have to go to find that? I mean, how many people see that? Well, I, I think that, that a, a big piece of who we are as Anglicans is, and this is not fair, <laughs> but I, we're often not the best at going out there and being, you know, this the little e evangelist of saying, like, let's go out and proclaim, you know, exactly what we do and know and love out to the world. We like to do things. Um, so I think if you look at the mission and the ministries of a specific church, that tells you a lot about who they are. And a, a big stepping stone for Episcopalians is to get out in the world and go talk about it to somebody else. Because um, we are doers. We're not necessarily always the best evangelizers about what we are actually doing and how that relates to the good news. Um, you repeatedly said we, mm -hmm. and there's also me there because we each have different talents. Um, that some of us are better able to proclaim <laughs> and provide that service. No, that's that's perfectly stated. So I think you can read these as. Uh, on any level that you need to. Um, so if you want to look at the entirety of the Anglican Communion, you can look at these. If you want to look at Christ and St. Luke's, you can look at these. But if you want to look at Cheryl, <laughs> look at those as well to say, what, what are the skills that God has given me and where do my talents call me into deeper relationship? Um, so these are important. And I think that for me, they're tied to the baptismal promises that we make. Um, they're not exactly worded the same. And these are a little older than the, you know, the five marks of mission as they are currently written. But, um, you know, these are important. So if you were here last week, we had our, our baptism and next week we have our confirmation. So we'll say the baptismal covenant again as part of confirmation and reception. But we have these six questions that we are asked. Um, and so, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers? Will you persevere in resisting evil and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God and Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being. Will you cherish the wonder, wondrous works of God and protect and restore the beauty and integrity of all creation? That's the newest one because when these were put into the, uh, the 79 prayer book, they didn't have a specific one about care of creation. So that's one that we add in here based off a of general convention um, update that allows for that. But I think, I hope you can see the overlap between these and tying what we do, so our mission, what we do is directly related to what we profess uh, and what we are called to do uh, by our baptism, so by our initiation. So all of this, again, ties that back to the very Anglican idea of the Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral of saying that baptism and the Eucharist are two of the sacraments that make up who we are as Christians, as specifically as Anglican Christians. Um, so that's important. Yes? On the previous slide, if we're 
saying, if we want to be one and two, therefore we won't be one and two, four and five. Mm -hmm. That's way. That's one way you can look at it. Yes. Are you specifically talking about Christ in St. Luke's? Because I'm better answered to answer that. Not every church does that well. <laughs> so, uh, so some of this work, I mean, if you look at our website, uh, you'll find it. But I would also say you know, part of the way we structure ourselves as Episcopalians is through relationships. So a lot of what we do is word of mouth. Um, and as you get connected at a place, you might learn that something is happening over there. And so there, that, that, there's gives and takes to that, I would say. A lot of the time, you know, to get to know something, uh, it takes a bit of, you know, self-work to get into where those, these activities are happening. But I would also say we just need to do a better job about promoting these as well. So it, it's a both and. But the website has a lot of good information about some of the different um, ministries that we have going on. We have the ministry fair that happens every uh, fall that kind of helps connect people to these different things that are not always publicly visible but are happening in the background. So there's ways of doing that. But I would, I would say that the relationship and getting to know someone that's doing the work is probably the most common way that someone comes into the work. Another way is the weekly news. Yeah, the weekly news, yeah. It's got a lot of information about what's going on and, and going, yeah. Vicki. I challenged myself this year to visit other churches during the course of the years, so I was in Bay of Lake, and several of them are not participating. And I found that I have learned a lot about our congregation just by visiting one on Sunday morning, by reading their announcements and what their missions and, and uh, various ministries are. So who remembers the final, what, what do we say after each of these promises? I will with God's help, yeah. So I think all of this is only possible through the means in which we're in relationship with God as well. So our relationship not only points us to others, but points us back to God. So I think that that's important, that this work is done with and in and through God. Um, so I, what I wanted to do now, and we're kind of close to the end of time and the end of this class, uh, is to run through, maybe this isn't even a good benefit of time. What would you prefer, to look at some upper level things that have come out of uh, Lambeth that are important in the life of Anglicanism moving forward now, or would you rather just pester me with questions? P <laughs> throw questions at me, not pester, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Pepper me, pepper me with questions. Challenge me, that's a better. Yeah, Freudian Swift. Option one. All right, we're going for option one. All right. I hear more of option one, unfortunately. All right, so. 
we'll move on with that. So a, a big one to come out of uh, Lambeth 22, which was the last time that the Lambeth conference met, was uh, one of the calls on the environment and sustainability. So we, we read some of the call last week from Human Dignity, which included the language about LGBT inclusion in the life of the church. This is a specific different call on the environment, which was in very important. So we, we have been gifted a world of breathtaking beauty, astounding abundance, and intricate interconnection. It is a world God declared good and loves. That world is now in crisis, climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution threaten both people and planet. Poverty, inequality, injustice, and conflict damage the lives of millions. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated inequalities and undermined the development gains of recent decades. Yet, this is still God's world, and God calls us to respond as Easter people, bearers of hope. We are called to have genuine mutual love expressed through hospitality, stewardship, and mutual service. These are essential in our care for one another and our common home and the earth. So, it should shock no one that environmental stewardship and addressing climate change is a major push uh, for everyone, but I just know that your church is doing this work. And so through all the things that we're gonna have to run through in the next you know, three minutes, think about how these global level issues can be worked on by you here. <laughs> So make that connection in your brain that you are a part of this. This is not just the church talking about this. If this work is going to be done, you have to do it. I'll help you. Everyone here will help you, but we have to do it. Um, so to that uh, end, just note that there's something called the Anglican Communion Forest, which is kind of talking about this. It's a contextualization of this massive idea that we're going to have to, to, to battle and to to work through. And so um, you can find this online. There's more uh, information about it. There's also a lot of environmental networks. The Episcopal Church has one. The Anglican Communion has one that we looked at. That's something really good to be involved in. And you can get involved in some of the, the upper level work and bring that back down to uh, your congregations and to your communities that you're working with. So um, the Anglican Communion Forest is looking at some of that contextualization of the work. So the work looks different depending on where you are. And I think that that's important. You know, what they're doing in the Philippines may not necessarily affect what we do here. Uh, but noting that by them doing that work, they are participating in a larger structure of us of tackling some of the big issues of our world. So environmental sus and sustainability. So we're going to go past this. Colonialism is a big thing. Uh, I've noted on it several times in this conversation. Uh, we don't have time to get into some of the nitty gritty of this today, but uh, I wish we did, and maybe that's worth a full uh, series later on, because we've, we've painted a very rosy view of how the church came to be, and it's, it's far more complex than that. Um, and so looking at the, the, just the reality of colonialism, we have some good resources to do that. So we're gonna pass this right now, but noting that there are indigenous voices throughout the communion that are deeply engaged with this work about how to tell the story of their Christian presence, which is a wonderful and beautiful Christian presence, uh, and still note that the, the ways in which uh, the uh, structures of our world brought Christianity to some places is a very, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dark tale <laughs> in lots of places. Uh, indigenous boarding schools is something you're going to see coming up in Episcopal Church conversations for, I hope, for a long time, because we have a deep reckoning that we have to do with uh, these schools. There was one that this diocese, Diocese of Southern Virginia, was connected to. So these are conversations that we're going to be have. So I'm flagging it here, and we can have a deeper conversation about it later. But I think that that's something that is uh, a broad thing for the entirety of the uh, Anglican Communion. I've got time to do this one as well. But representation in the communion, especially for women, is a large comp topic of conversation. Um, we talked about last week, I, I threw the statistic at you, that the average Anglican, if you look at the, the demographics of our church, the average Anglican is a woman living in sub-Saharan Africa. So in terms of our numbers, women make up the vast majority of the worshiping body of the Anglican communion. And so that's, that's really important in terms of how we talk about representation, because this is uh, every single female bishop in the Anglican Communion in 2008. 
uh, which is better than what it was because it used to be zero. Uh, and the Episcopal Church and I believe Church in Canada were the first two to start uh, female uh, ordination. So if you've heard of the Philadelphia 11, uh, which is a really uh, uh, important documentary that's coming out about telling the story of the Episcopal Church uh, moving towards uh, women's ordination. Uh, that's happening now. I'm hoping to be able to bring that here. Um, but, but that's a really important conversation. And then that leads to opening up the, the office of bishops to, to women as well. And so in 2008, this is every single female bishop. This is the 2022 Lambeth Conference. So that, that's a substantial um, increase. Uh, in the number of female bishops that are representing uh, the Anglican Communion in comparison to uh, all of the bishops of the Anglican Communion as well uh, all together. And I will just say this is a very funny photo to see taking place uh, when they're all getting into the risers um, at Lambeth Conference. It is it's a joy to see uh, all the bishops in this. But all that to say, I mean, we have some very uh, important work in, in making sure that the leadership of our church, not only in the Episcopal Church, but advocating for leadership across the Anglican Communion to better reflect the people that are involved in the church. So not only in indigenous voices and in women voices, but uh, voices of LGBT individuals. Uh, and so noting that how we do that work is, is very important as well. I've got to go to the 1015, but does anybody have any questions real quick before I run out? I just want to highlight the environmental aspect of what we do in at Christ's Center. We have caring for creation. It's a wonderful thing that will do anything you like to, as far as saving our environment. So I hope you'll join me. Thank you. What's the name? I think they meet on Joseph's evenings at 6 o'clock. They had one of his class Thursday. Such a good day. So next week, uh, Bishop Haynes will be with us for uh, an adult forum, and it'll be an open conversation with her, so I do hope you'll join us for that. I believe that's going to be in this room as well. This is, we're hoping to move the adult forum to here. And then following that, we're going to have a bit of fun. We're going to look at uh, different uh, Christmas stories and books uh, and pull some of the, the different tellings of the goodness of Christmas out of our secular film. So I think we're going to start with... Uh, what is it? Uh, it's a Wonderful Life uh, is coming first. Uh, I'll be doing Elf and uh, Rudolph uh, towards the end of the Advent season as well. So it's going to be a fun time, uh, a little more lighthearted than the polity of Anglican. So I hope you'll join us for that. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you.